Hey folks, welcome back to Israel Explained. Happy New Year or Happy New Year's Eve, as the case may be. Um, today we'll be discussing the Israeli decision to um, rotate a lot of troops out of the Gaza Strip. So we don't know the exact numbers, but we had at the peak of the operation close to five Israeli divisions in Gaza. At this point, there's significantly less and entire reservist units are being removed from the Gaza Strip back to Israel for a undefined amount of time. This is the first time during this operation, which has been incredibly high intensity, that Israel is lowering the number of troops that are in there. And that raises the question of, of why. Um, what does this mean for the rest of the operation? Uh, removing troops from the area in large numbers definitely means a lowering of intensity of the conflict, at least in the short term. And there could be different reasons for this. One reason could be that the entire uh, operation is shifting to something lower intensity. And the other is they're taking advantage of a time when there are fewer targets in order to rest troops, in order to regroup and um, continue the attack at the same ferocity as before or something similar. Uh, according to the Israeli official statements, nothing has changed in the way that they're viewing this conflict. It remains high intensity, and the goal of the conflict remains to completely destroy Hamas. Um, however, leaks and um, off-the-record comments that we're hearing from the IDF and from members of the Israeli government um, uh, may indicate something different. So we're going to kind of unpack that um, unpack that today. So first, let's um, look at what Israel is currently engaged in in Gaza. There's certainly a lot of fighting going on right now. Uh, the fighting in Gaza City is almost over, but Israel didn't go into Tufah. That's a neighborhood in the old city in Gaza City. That's continuing. The um, Hamas brigade there has yet to surrender or be destroyed. That's a matter of days from what I'm hearing. In the central camps around Burej, the fighting has almost concluded, but hasn't completely concluded. The Burej brigade is more or less destroyed. There are other camps there as well. Their brigades haven't been completely destroyed. That's a work in progress. Khan Yunus hasn't been completely captured. However, a lot of it has been taken and the most strategic areas in the city have been taken. Fighting continues in Khirbat Ifza, which is an area in the um, south uh, west of the um, Gaza Strip, where a lot of the um, Hamas terrorists who operated on October 7th came out of. That area is almost under complete IDF control. None of these are new arenas of battle. Israel opened uh, all of them um, a week ago or so. Uh, and is concluding fighting above ground, important to stress above ground, especially in the case of Khan Yunus, in all um, of those locations. Some good news for the IDF coming out of Khan Yunus, a bunch of Nukhba warriors or Nukhba terrorists, that's the elite unit of Hamas, surrendered today and went into the hands of, um, of the IDF. So we mentioned all the places where the fighting is is ongoing, but one of them is a lot more important than the others, and that's Khan Yunus. Khan Yunus is where the Hamas leadership relocated from Gaza City when it was clear that that city would fall completely to the IDF. Uh, that seems to have been the plan from the beginning, that that would be the fallback city, and that is indeed what happened. What the IDF is doing right now in Khan Yunus is unprecedented in terms of the amount of troops you have in such a small area. There's seven brigades operating in the sort of command zone of Khan Yunus, which is believed to be where Sinwar is. They're um, taking over the area above ground and increasingly operating beneath ground to try to locate Sinwar. Um, a couple of people I've talked to are telling me this is the largest concentration of troops in a small area in the history of the IDF and one of the largest in the history of modern warfare. So that's the kind of intensity that we're talking about there. That may sound divorced from what I said about the intensity lowering, but everywhere else, the intensity is definitely lowering because above ground, there simply isn't that much resistance anymore. It's not so much that Hamas has been completely broken 
as much as their capacity and willingness to engage the IDF above ground in just about the entire strip has ended, at least for now. The idea of having all those brigades in central Khan Yunis is to cut off Sinwar. According to Israeli intelligence, he's still in Khan Yunis and isn't planning to leave Khan Yunis, probably because it's important to him to be where the action is so that he can continue to command his troops. And that's something the IDF is noticing. And think of it as a kind of weakness that Sinwar has, or at least something they can use to their advantage. He isn't really afraid to die. That's clear. He's willing to take on the IDF, but he doesn't seem to be willing to sacrifice his political power. So what Israel's trying to do now is isolate him from the rest of the Hamas command by taking down tunnel after tunnel by killing uh, commander after commander beneath him, by cutting off his links with everyone else. That is happening to some extent, not as much as the IDF um, wanted to. But it's believed that if that can continue for a while, it will put enough pressure on Sinwar to start talking about the release of hostages, which is a major goal that Israel has, and perhaps even talk about that final um, agreement to evacuate Gaza, which the Egyptians are talking about. So to bring him more towards a political horizon. Killing him is very problematic. A, he's, you know, a bit of a rat and it's very difficult to locate him. But perhaps more importantly, IDF intelligence is fairly certain that he's surrounded by hostages. So killing him without killing a whole bunch of hostages may be impossible. And that's one of the reasons Sinwar hasn't been um, killed so far. So the, what we're seeing here is that without much else to, to fight above ground, the battle is increasingly going underground. And because Hamas is operating above ground so little now, the number of rockets being fired at Israel has also fallen drastically. And that was one of the main missions the IDF had to prevent rockets from falling. Even though rockets continued to fall, if you look at the chart of how many rockets were shot, it, the IDF had great success in lowering it week by week, until now their capacity is almost non-existent to fire rockets on Israel. The areas that where the IDF isn't are being heavily patrolled by the Israeli Air Force and Israeli intelligence. It's very hard for them to shoot anything um, at all. Um, so... We're seeing with this being the situation that all these units are starting to come back for air into Israel. Now, these boys really need their rest. They've been fighting relentlessly for a very long time. But up until now, that hasn't happened. So it's significant um, to, to do so. We're very happy. They're getting, some of them are getting back to work, getting to see their families. This is a very good development. So uh, there's no way I'm against this or anything like that. I'm just trying to figure out what it actually means. So one element here, I already mentioned they're going back to work, is that will help the economy. The Israeli economy can't go on at this level of intensity forever. We already mentioned that. The amount of ammunition being used, the amount of people out of work. The amount of ammunition being used right now is down. And the amount of people out of work is down because some people are returning to their jobs. Now, make no mistake, having reservists come back to their jobs temporarily when they can be called up any day isn't really going to save the economy. It's a, a little bit of a band-aid. It um, improves economic performance by a little bit, not, all, not by all that much. For the economy to go back to its full capacity, uh, there needs to be a more predictable pattern of the return of reservists. So it helps there but it doesn't help all that much. Another element that's certainly in play here is the American demand to lower intensity of the conflict. It's already been decided that um, the conflict will be lowered at some point in January. And since the IDF doesn't really have all that many targets above ground to go after anymore, um, a lot of people in the IDF are okay with lowering that right now. And that way, Israel can enjoy some of the benefits of uh, better relations with the United States, especially after some very tense confrontations between Netanyahu and Biden, which we talked about um, in previous episodes. Now, there's another element that may be the most important of all, depending how things develop, and that's Lebanon. So in Lebanon, there's been constant fighting. 
Um, also, many Israelis have had to evacuate their homes. Basically, the entire area of the border with Lebanon has been evacuated by Israeli civilians, which is really a sign of weakness for Israel at many levels. And while the, the escalation there was under control for a long time, Israel has engaged in a policy of assassinating Iranian officials, as we've seen over the, less, the last month. And that has led to an increase in fire from Hezbollah, who are trying to uh, retaliate for that. So matters in Lebanon are really not under control. And the American attempts to negotiate are not going very well. So there is a chance that some of these forces are being rotated with the thought of resting them before they start an operation in Lebanon. Operation in Lebanon may require, depending on how it's designed, more troops than in Gaza, because reaching the kind of intensity that you have in Gaza on a much bigger geographical area in Lebanon would actually require more divisions than Gaza did. Even to approach that level of firepower would require more. So that is another reason people are being rested right now. Um, the idea of spokesperson, uh, Daniel Hagari, said today that fighting will continue throughout 2024. However, he didn't say at what intensity. So again, what we're seeing is a preparation for the long haul. Uh, lower intensity for longer time. That allows soldiers to get, to get some rest. But the military is concerned, not so much because we're switching to a lower intensity conflict, but they're concerned because there's no clear direction from the government on when, how to do it, and how that links to a diplomatic resolution of the conflict. Um, I'm going to read you a quote from the Times of Israel that appeared today. Um, so one reporter wrote, a senior source told this writer that without thorough and fundamental preparation right now for the day after, the whole idea of phases could collapse. Instead of transitioning from phase three, targeted fighting, which is what we're starting to do now, to phase four, withdrawing from the strip and civil governance there by a local leadership, something that Israel has not even discussed in a serious manner, Israel could find itself returning to phase two, which is high intensity fighting. So if Israel starts to uh, cycle out troops, doesn't have a clear resolution. It looks like it's just going to occupy the Gaza Strip forever. Uh, a lot of people in the military are concerned. Hamas, which hasn't been destroyed and which still retains its power underground underneath Khan Yunus and continues to control Rafah, will start to escalate its fighting against the IDF. And then the IDF will be caught. They're concerned in some kind of quagmire. That's the nightmare the Israeli military actually has. So does Israel have to remain stuck? Is this uh, a problem that Israel can't avoid? I, I don't see it that way at all. I think Israel has two um, choices right now that it can take. One is to escalate by moving into Rafah and taking over the Philadelphia route. As I've said here repeatedly, that's what I support. I don't see any point in letting Hamas continue to control any part of the Gaza Strip, especially since they're getting the humanitarian aid from there, distributing it as they want, and that is keeping up their fighting capabilities. It, on some level, I think that what Israel is doing right now is suicidal. So I think that that's what Israel should do. If it's not going to do that, it should transition um, to the low intensity phase, take over the areas it's taking over, squash resistance there, continue to operate in Khan Yunus and other places in order to destroy the tunnels, but officially say we're in the low intensity phase, uh, cycle out troops in case there's an escalation or for the north. The advantage to that is that Israel has somewhere to escalate to if it needs to apply pressure and it gets to enjoy the benefits of improved relations with the United States. Um, I already said I would prefer an escalation at this point, then moving to low intensity. But what it's doing right now, it's not moving to low intensity, and it's not escalating to Rafah, and that's the worst of both worlds. That This way, Israel is starting to become diplomatically isolated. It's starting to wear thin the patience of the United States, 
while not looking like it has a direction and while allowing Hamas to continue to control parts of the Gaza Strip. So the way this turns into a quagmire is if Israel continues doing what it's doing now, saying that it's in the high-intensity phase, bombing a lot of areas in Gaza, but without even the possibility of taking over the entire Strip because it's not moving into Rafah. So I think this is um, a real mistake. No matter what Israel pursues, uh, I want, yeah, either one of those options, that has to be followed by what the IDF is calling phase four, which is, I'll quote it um, again, withdrawing from the strip and civil governance there by a local leadership, temporary until there can be a more permanent move to a security uh, architecture and a form of Palestinian independence that Israel can um, live with. Doing something in between the way Israel is doing now and not switching to phase four mean the military and diplomatic situations will deteriorate in the long term. So what I'm saying here isn't that Israel is in terrible trouble, isn't that Israel is destined to go into a quagmire, rather that it has to be very careful and deliberate in what it does now. And in this case, it's an old maxim of war. It's better to make a decision and pursue it doggedly than not to make a decision at all. The worst decision you can make in warfare is indecision, because then reality is forced onto you by your enemies, and that is Israel's nightmare. Okay, um, I got some great questions from from you guys. Also, my, my last video, you may have noticed, was um, with my friend Khaled. Um, Hope you enjoyed that. I'm sure I'll have many more conversations with Khaled because I find them very productive. Um, but let's get to the questions. Ian asks, would supplying aid via the sea maybe encourage the displaced people to move out of Rafah back to the central and northern parts of Gaza? Would it then open up Rafah to military operations? Great question, Ian. That really depends on Israel. If Israel decides that it wants to use the entry of aid from the sea, as a means to clear civilians out of Rafah, it can certainly do so. Now, those of you who haven't seen the news, Israel negotiated with several countries um, to allow aid in by sea. So Israel will secure uh, allowing sea into the ports of Gaza through its naval forces, and several countries, including the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, the United States, will be involved in delivering that aid. That's a great thing to begin with because then that aid can be distributed by Israel. But if Israel wants people to move out of Rafah to other places, it needs to do a few things that it hasn't done yet. It needs to create safe zones for Palestinian civilians in areas far from Rafah near where the aid will be delivered. That requires um, declaring that in certain areas of the Strip, those operations will be ceased. Israel will have to take control um, for security reasons, stop Hamas from making attacks there, but prevent it from being a war zone, try to make it a safe zone. It will also probably have to warn people in Rafah that it's about to go in there and that they'll be safer elsewhere. In the past, when Israel's done that, people have left. Of course, Hamas will resist that. So Israel needs to decide that that's their policy, move civilians to an area where Israel can distribute aid, and move them out of Rafah. If it does that, absolutely, it could do that. But that requires a decision from the government, not from the military, and that's something that Israel hasn't done yet. Uh, Bimaya asks, Ynet is reporting a deal for a 30-day pause for 40 or 50 hostages. Is that part of the Egyptian or Qatali, Qatari deal or something completely new? Great question. Um, so right now there's two tracks of negotiations, neither one of which is going particularly well. One track is the Egyptian one. The Egyptian one is focused on ending the war. Um, the Qatari one is involved uh, with another hostage release deal, similar to the last one, but significantly longer. The two tracks are competing. And the one that, that you mentioned uh, in your question, Bumaya, is the Qatari track. The Qatari track is um, uh, unifying around the idea that you mentioned, 40 to 50 hostages. Uh, 30 days is more than Israel is willing to agree to at this point, but that's what Hamas wants. Israel is willing to agree to 20. Um, that 
has a chance of happening, more chance than I thought uh, a week ago. One of the main reasons for that is that Israel's, as I said, running out of targets above ground. It wouldn't feel like it's a massive sacrifice at this point to stop for 20, 30 days the way it would have felt that that would have been a sacrifice when it made the last deal. The disadvantage of that from the Israeli perspective is that it would strengthen Qatar, and at this point, Israel is trying to strengthen Egypt instead. It sees strengthening Qatar as something contrary to its interests. So this isn't something new. It's part of the Qatari track. It may happen, but it's nowhere near fruition. And of course, I'll keep you all updated here as we get closer to something happening. One of those deals will be the basis of something soon. Uh, JDB asks, I fear Netanyahu cares first and foremost about keeping his job, and this will drive his decisions more than what is best for Israel in the long term. Even if his coalition were to break up, is there anyone else in Israel who can form a coalition of 61 plus seats? So the answer to that is definitely yes. There uh, are people in the Likud who want Netanyahu out, are increasingly speaking openly about wanting Netanyahu out, or at least speaking openly about challenging him. The two people who are doing that most clearly are Yuli Edelstein and Nir Barkat. Both of them are individuals who are not in the extreme wing of the Likud. I hesitate to call them moderates, but by Likud standards, they're both pretty moderate. And therefore would be able to work with other parties. They both would also be able to work with Shas and um, uh, United Torah Judaism. So they would be able to swing a coalition. But the linchpin here is the Likud. So if the Likud could and did remove Netanyahu, that would improve relations with Benny Gantz and his party, um, would probably deteriorate relations with Ben Gvir and Smotrich, although not necessarily. I mean, those two people could work with Ben Gvir and Smotrich. Um, so basically, though they could, could do it. But they would just need to get rid of Netanyahu. There's more and more people who want to do that, but there's also a lot of defenders of him in the party. I don't see that happening right now, but it theoretically could happen. Of course, another thing that could happen is the the other parties could gather around Gantz instead of the Likud. Um, but that seems kind of hard to believe. That would involve the Haredi parties, the ultra-Orthodox parties, uh, abandoning Netanyahu, moving over to the left. Um, then, he, then he could also take Lieberman and um, take uh, the Labour Party. That would require a, a complete realignment. So basically what would need to happen for that is that Netanyahu, who's already really low on legitimacy and support at this point, would have to lose some more support and legitimacy, uh, which is perfectly possible considering how badly he's handling things. So we're not there yet, but I could totally see it happening if um, the war really seems to be going in the wrong direction. So it's not something I'm hoping for, even though I want Netanyahu to be gone, because it would probably involve Israel uh, getting into some serious problems. But as we saw in this episode, there's oh, the lack of decision is already eroding the Israeli position in Gaza. So if Netanyahu wants to survive, he better get himself together and do something more decisive. Okay, so that's the end of this uh, special New Year's Eve um, episode of Israel Explained. If you like what I do here, consider supporting me on Patreon at Shael Media on Patreon. I also just put out a new episode of the History of the Land of Israel podcast talking about the arrival of the Philistines in the Land of Israel, uh, ending the Bronze Age and starting the Iron Age and starting the Biblical Age, more important. So um, I wish you all a happy new year. I haven't decided yet if I'll do a video tomorrow or not. We'll see, but I'll definitely be back here on the second. So um, happy new year to all of you.